Welcome back to the podcast. This is the second in a two-part series of uh, episodes on sex and love. And the four authors that I'm discussing in these two episodes that go together are Aristophanes, Lucretius, Freud, and Plato. And the way that I'm organizing these thinkers is that one of them at any rate thinks that sex and love are meaningless. That's Lucretius. And the three others think that sex and love are meaningful, but they disagree about whether the meaning is the same for everybody, and that's Plato's view, or whether the meaning is particular to each of us, and that's Freud's view. Aristophanes is is in some ways a combination of the two, uh, and I discussed him last time. But in this episode, I'm going to be discussing Freud and Plato. So they both agree that sex and love are meaningful, and in fact, they both think they're very meaningful. Uh, This is one thing that, despite their many differences, they share that I think makes them um, very similar thinkers, uh, because love is really at the center of each philosophy. But they disagree about its meaning. Uh, they, they have very different views of what its what its meaning is, and and on this way that I'm dividing them, Freud thinks that the meaning of your sexual desire, your particular sexual desire, and and the way in which you fall in love, the people with whom you fall in love, the reasons for which you fall in love, those are entirely particular to you. And if you seek self knowledge, as Freudian psychoanalysis has you do, then the meaning that you find in those desires and attractions and patterns of behavior will reveal something unique to you. Whereas for Plato, to learn the meaning of sex and love is not to learn anything specific about you. I don't want to say nothing specific about you, but that the the ultimate meaning of sex and love are going to be the same for you as they are for me or for any other human being. So let's get into the details first of Freud and then of Plato. And then I think at the end, I'd like to to step back and look at all four thinkers uh, together. All right, Freud. This is this theory that I'm about to present is from his 1905 work called The Three Essays on the Theory of Sexuality. And really to understand Freud's philosophy or thinking about the soul, if you like, the, the two crucial treatises are this one, the, what's called the sex book, and his dream book. And in an earlier episode, I talked about Freud on dreams, an essay that he writes to summarize his dream book of 1899-1900, The Interpretation of Dreams. So with that dream theory behind us, we're now adding the other pillar of uh, the Freudian philosophy, if you like, and that is uh, his, the sexual component. And they're compatible. A lot of what he says about dreams is going to uh, be in the background here of his theory of sex, and I'll try to bring it in whenever I can. So Freud is considering a question, and I I, I advise my students this, and I'll I'll emphasize this at this point in the podcast if I haven't already. I hope I'll bring it up again. When when considering any philosopher, uh, any, any philosopher's writings, the most important thing you can do Uh, in understanding it is to appreciate the question that the philosopher is trying to answer. Not, maybe not all philosophical texts are trying to answer a question, but most are. And if you don't really, first of all, see clearly the question, and I think feel the question as something that you really want to answer yourself, it's sometimes hard to maintain interest in a philosophical text, and it's hard ultimately to make sense of it. Uh, If you don't really have this intuitive sense, this deep sense of what the question is, in the end, what the philosopher says, uh, no matter how uh, intelligent, uh, will will seem like um, a bunch of random thoughts. And, and, uh, and you know, it's unfortunate as a teacher that I see so often students coming away from a complicated text like this one, thinking, "Oh, that's just a bunch of crazy thoughts Freud had about sex." The unity of the text is—I don't want to say guaranteed—that's too strong a word because there are definitely problems and incoherencies in this text, but. The, the unity such as it is of this text, like others, is given by the various strategies to answer a fundamental question. All right, so what is the question? Freud has in mind uh, what he considers a popular view of sexuality. And remember, this is 1905, so I wouldn't 
so uncar- you know, un- unequivocally say this is a popular view now, but I, I think it's a common view that people have of sexuality. And it's also, in 1905 and to a lesser extent now, a normative view, namely this isn't just a, people, a view that a lot of people hold, but when many of the people hold this view, they hold it as the way things should be, not just how things are when it comes to sexuality. There are two components of this popular normative view, according to Freud. One is that uh, sex has a natural object and a natural aim. So first, I, I should distinguish object and aim. They're technical words for him. An object is the target of a desire or a wish. And so um, if you uh, want to have sex with an adult, then the object is an adult. If you want to have sex with a male, then the object is a male. The aim, by contrast, is what you want to do with that object. So if you want to have sex with an Uh, an adult, your object is adult. If you want to copulate with that adult, then that's your aim. And the, uh, there are other aims, of course, looking, touching, kissing, and so on. So Freud, using that technical distinction, object versus aim, says that the popular normative view uh, is that there is a natural object to sexual desire, and that is an adult of the opposite sex, and the aim is that you uh, will copulate for the purpose of reproduction with that person. So this view, as I say, is not as popular uh, now in 2019 as I'm recording this, uh, nor is it considered universally normative, but there are certainly pockets of uh, American culture, certainly, where this view is held, And uh, there's an institution that has this view as its official moral theology, as it's called. And that is, I'm thinking of the Catholic Church. Uh, Robert George is a thinker, uh, professor at Princeton University. And he's probably the name most often associated with the effort to defend this view uh, without using scripture. Uh, So giving what's called a natural explanation, uh, an explanation in terms, some, sometimes even tries to do it in terms of science, but uh, reasons that are supposed to be compelling to any human being, whether they're Catholic or not. He's written a series of books, one called What is Marriage, with several co-authors, uh, defending what he calls the marital view of sex. And it's, it's just this, uh, what Freud calls the popular view, namely that Sex should be between a man and a woman who are married, uh, and should be for uh, should be copulative ultimately for the purpose of reproduction. Now, this view is uh, no matter how popular it ever was, whether in 1905 or 2019, whether it's held by the Catholic Church and its defenders or, or any other pocket of American culture. No matter how popular it is in expression, it's uh, uh, disobeyed in practice, as we all know. So that uh, many sexual encounters, I would say most, are not seeking reproduction, certainly not since the pill, but probably before that as well. Uh, Probably just as many sexual encounters before the pill uh, or reliable contraception didn't want there to be reproduction, even if they were less effective in avoiding that outcome. And Freud's aware of that. Freud, you know, this is before the Kinsey report uh, that revealed the diversity of American sexual practices. Uh, whatever criticisms one might make of it, it uh, in its details, it certainly was right in that people were not behaving in their bedrooms the way they uh, claim to behave whenever the topic was being discussed publicly. So Freud, one mystery uh, that this question that this treatise sets out to aim is how to explain the, the plurality of sexual practices in light of the fact that there is this popular normative view that seems so out of touch with what's actually happening. And, you know, I, I mentioned the Catholic Church and, and one particular Catholic thinker 
who has you know devoted a career to um, many other things, but uh, as I say, as a, as, a, as a clear proponent of that marital view and defending it in terms of natural reasons. Well, there is a, a religious um, cast to the popular normative view, but but there's also a scientific Darwinian cast to that view, which is what is the purpose of sex from the Darwinian point of view? It's to, um, well, again, you, you don't want to talk about purposes in a Darwinian world, but uh, why why are there sexual organisms uh, in nature, uh, given the truth of the Darwinian evolutionary theory? And it's that sexual organisms were better able to adapt to environments and produce genetic diversity and, uh, as a result, adapt, uh, and so outwitted um their competitors. But the sexual activity that's necessary for that explanation to be true is simply copulation for the purpose of reproduction, or again, taking out the purpose language as, as one must ultimately with Darwin's theory, copulation that resulted in reproduction. That was selected for presumably because it made organisms that did that more reproductively successful more more their more of their genetic material got into the next generation than did the genetic material of organisms that weren't doing that or weren't sexual at all so just as the religious view the catholic view um, has something to explain when it has this norm that people should be um, having marital sex and not other kinds of sex it has to explain uh, why so many people do so many non quote marital things, so too does the Darwinian view have to explain why is it that organisms for whom let's call it marital sex in the sense of um, heterosexual uh, a male and female organ uh, organism there's a natural explanation for why they would copulate to reproduce, but what will be the Darwinian explanation for why? Animals and certainly humans do so many other things besides that. And just to give a sense of the topics that Freud considers, he talks about kissing, touching, and looking, as I mentioned, uh, but also oral and anal sex, homosexuality, sadism and masochism, as he calls them. But you know, he's, he doesn't have the acronym, but we would say nowadays BDSM, bondage, discipline, domination. Submission, sadism, and masochism. He also considers fetishes for foot, for feet, and for hair, and by extension for shoes and for fur, and an infinite number of fetishes that one can find on the internet nowadays. Uh, but also bestiality and pedophilia. So there's those are you know, some most of the so-called perversions that Freud considers. And by perverse, he's usually wor- using that word in a non-judgmental way, simply. So perversions in quotation marks, if you like. Perversions in the sense that they are diversions off the, the main track. Uh, perversion is sort of turning away from the, um, from the main track. And the main track here is, again, that popular normative view, which has warrant, whether in uh, Catholic moral theology or Darwinian evolutionary biology, there's a problem, namely... Uh, Given that popular view, especially as it's expressed by science and religion, why is there so much diversity in sexual fantasy and sexual behavior? So that's that's a mystery that Freud is trying to answer in this treatise. And and I, I, I guess I've spent a lot of time setting this up. One of the reasons I do this is because there is there are some false notes, certainly, in Freud's answer to this question. But I think it's really important to see what the question is, and you know, I invite you to think: Who else do you know who has addressed this question so squarely? I think the evolutionary psychologists are doing a lot in this regard, and um, I'm not equipped at this point to give a separate lecture on the evolutionary psychology of sex. I mean, partially because this is. Uh, a philosophy podcast and also because I'm using these ideas to explain Black Mirror episodes and use Black Mirror to illustrate them. I'm not sure that that could be done with evolutionary psychology at this point. But at any rate, to Freud's credit, whatever the false notes in the account that I'm about to give of him are, the fact that he he's, he focuses on this question, which I think really needs to be answered. In fact, if it's not being answered, if you haven't considered it, 
that's already a question. Why is it some, it's a question that's so obvious once you put it to yourself? Why is it not something that you've considered answering? Why are philosophers who, who claim to talk about important questions, uh, and if, if, if they think sex and love are important, uh, here's an obvious mystery right at the heart of our sexual doctrines and practice. Why aren't there, you know, obvious answers to this question? Why can't we just list 10 philosophers' views on this particular question? I, I, I can't myself. And so I think Freud's to be admired for trying. So <clears throat> those perversions we can summarize in Freud's terms already and say that any perversion, again in quotation marks, not judging necessarily, that they are perversions either of object or of aim. So if you take kissing, touching, and looking, those are perverse, in quotation marks again, for he doesn't think there's actually anything perverse about those things, but that they are not copulation. So since that's the natural aim of sexuality, kissing, looking, and touching are not copulation, and so they're perverse aims. The way that they are assimilated to the popular normative view is that they're considered foreplay to copulation, but that really just pushes the question back another step because why would they be found sexy at all? Why would people want to do those things at all if they're not part of the process inherently? Why are they foreplay rather than some totally other things uh, being foreplay, like playing chess beforehand or whatever? So those are um, non-normative aims. Um, oral and anal sex, again, depends how you consider an object. If, if these are two heterosexual people, uh, well, if the object is the person of the other sex, then, then the object remains normative, but the aim is non-normative because what's being done with the person is not copulation for the purpose of reproduction, but rather stimulation of some other part of the body. Or in some cases, a person might be so interested in those activities that the object is not, in fact, the whole person. It's not that they're thinking, I'm going to be having sex with this person and I'm going to be stimulating this part of this person's body, but rather they, they're focused on that part of the body. That's what they want. And in that case, it would be a non-normative aim because now we're not even talking about two people, but rather a person focused not on a whole person, but on the part of a body. In homosexuality, that's a non-normative object because it's not two heterosexual people but uh, rather two people of the same sex. In BDSM, it could be a heterosexual couple. It could, of course, be a homosexual couple. But if it's a heterosexual couple, the aim is not normative. They're not doing uh, copulative sex for the purpose of reproduction. In fact, some people who are into that scene uh, don't ever copulate. Uh, it's simply you know, a power play game. And so on for the, for the fetishes. The fetishes are non-normative objects, uh, as, as is bestiality and, and pedophilia. Now, Freud has some initial thoughts about why people are not more honest about what's actually happening in their bedrooms, why it is that they evince the popular view, even though it's so out of step with what they're actually doing, and his three candidates for the enforcers of popular normativity about sexuality are morality, shame, and disgust. And, you know, morality and shame speak for themselves. Of course, the moralities of every culture are slightly, in some cases, extremely different when it comes to sexuality. In fact, Sextus Empiricus of the second century AD in Rome has this marvelous list of all of the sexual practices, not all, but many sexual practices of antiquity showing how things that are scorned in one culture are, in fact, celebrated in another. He talks about prostitution, for example, how in, um, I think in Rome, I mean, it wasn't uh, scorned the way it is now in, in Christian cultures, but that uh, there was some opprobrium for prostitution, whereas I think he's talking about Babylon or somewhere in the East where there are temple prostitutes and it was part of religion. At any rate, morality and shame are two enforcers of the popular view, but also disgust. And one of my favorite lines of Freud comes up in this context, and he's talking about the relativity of disgust, how um, someone who says that they won't perform oral sex because they find it disgusting. Um, he, he points to the fact, oh, I'll just quote, a man who will kiss a pretty girl's lips passionately 
may perhaps be disgusted at the idea of using her toothbrush. So, of course, the same saliva is exchanged in a passionate kiss as is exchanged in using uh, her toothbrush, probably a lot less in the case of the toothbrush. And yet the toothbrush is considered disgusting, but the, the kiss on the lips is not. And Freud's quite aware that things that activities that people would in any other context find disgusting, like touching or let alone licking parts of bodies that... Um, you know, they would find disgusting in any other context when there's a sexual attraction. Instead of being disgusting, it's in fact experienced as, as exciting. I didn't mention the second part of the popular view of sexuality. So beyond the normative object and aim, that's the first part. The second part of the popular view of sexuality that I think still remains is that children are not sexual, that sex, sexual desire arrives with puberty. And Freud thinks that um, that is the key to the mystery. It's the fact that people will not think of children as sexual that keeps them from understanding why it is that so many things beyond copulation between heterosexual people for the purpose of reproduction, why so many things beyond that are sexually appealing and exciting to people. Because once we acknowledge, he thinks, that children are sexual, and once we consider the sexual stages through which children develop, we will see the multiplicity of objects and aims that go along with those stages, and that adult sexuality is, to a greater or lesser extent in every individual, the, the assimilation, the aggregation, the collection of the results of each person's movement through those stages. So this is why the meaning of sex for each person is different because Freud's going to describe universal stages, if you like, that everybody has to go through and, and uh, universal meanings for each of those stages, but that since everybody goes through those stages to a greater or lesser extent, some people in fact get fixated at one point and don't move on to the next stages, that in your case, to take a particular person, in your case, you will have a unique set of things that you find sexually appealing that, and sexual behaviors that uh, testify to your particular trajectory. And so that if you want to understand yourself, you can survey those things that you find exciting. And, and shame, morality, and disgust will be inhibitions in being frank with yourself about what those are and the psychoanalytic method of free association might be necessary for you to actually even get in touch with what it is that you find exciting, but that once that's revealed, you can reconstruct how it is that you came to that point uh, to, to, have, to find those particular things exciting, and you can learn significant things about your own soul as a result. So what are those stages? This is the solution, if you will, to the sexual mystery. Uh, There's also a mystery about love for Freud, and that is he's going to claim that children are sexual, and the proof of this claim is going to be in whether or not that claim and the stages that he uh, breaks that claim down into, whether these can, in the end, explain the diversity of sexual practices I mentioned earlier. So there are five stages, well, three really important stages that happen very early in life and then two later. So just quickly, the oral stage happens between birth and two years old, the anal stage, which happens between two and three years old, the genital stage, which happens between three and five years old. These are rough figures, but typical. Those are the first three, the most important stages. They all happen before roughly the age of five when the major moves in one's sexual development are made or not made, as the case may be. And then the two other stages are what's called latency, which happens after the genital stage, so roughly five until puberty. And then the final stage is puberty, which most people consider the beginning of sexuality, even today, but certainly in 1905, but even today, most people consider that's the beginning. No, for Freud, the, the beginning is the moment that the baby is born. Because when the baby is born, it has an immediate need for milk and it gets that milk typically from a breast now of course we have 
uh, Similac, ways to give babies uh, nutrition through bottles, and that's not new. But babies do come into the world. We know now from um, you know careful analysis of their eye movements that they come predisposed to recognize nipple-shaped things, and they they gravitate towards them. It makes good Darwinian sense that they would have that program. And they latch onto breasts more or less successfully. And what do they get from that experience? Well, they get nourishment, of course, which is satisfying. They go from the intense pain of hunger, uh, very intense pain for them, it seems, based on their facial expressions and their, their screaming. They go from that intense pain to being soothed and, and then in a state of bliss uh, when they're done. They get not only nourishment from that experience, but also love. And Freud thinks that they don't recognize a, a whole person at first. And this might be later Freudian thinkers that I'm, I'm remembering. But uh, it's common in psychoanalysis that to think that the baby has a relationship first with the breast and then later with the, the whole mother. Uh, and I'm not sure how well that stood up to empirical verification because babies are also attuned to the person who, <laughs> whose breast that is and the tone of voice that she uses. And, um, you know, mothers have usually an intuitive sense of how close to get to the baby's face, which is the optimal uh, range that the baby can see in. You know, babies are not able to focus too close. They're not able to focus too far. And, and mothers have an intuitive sense, many of them, of what the right distance is. At any rate, the baby gets not only nourishment from that experience, but also its first exposure to love and attention. And Freud's observing that in this phase, the pleasure that's derived from that combination of nourishment and love is felt in the nerve endings of the mouth. So that what he calls oral pleasure is simply the, the pleasure of sucking at the breast and it gets imbued with emotional significance. It gets imbued with bodily significance, the relief of pain and that blissful feeling that the baby seems to have upon the satisfaction of its hunger, but also the emotional significance of love and attention so that the mouth becomes a locus, uh, an erotogenic zone, he ends up calling these places, it becomes a locus of pleasure. And to say that children, babies are sexual is something Freud believes, but it's not quite as uh, controversial as it sounds. By sexual at that point, he means um, you know, intense bodily pleasure that, that will eventually express itself in many people as genital orgasm, but that it starts with the, the feeling in the lips. Now, he calls this stage also the cannibalistic stage. Uh, this is the baby's devouring another person, taking in substance from the other person. And there's a certain style of relationship that the baby develops with that other person. It's either take in from the other person in the case of sucking uh, and swallowing or rejecting the other person, spitting out the milk because the baby's too full or, or doesn't like the taste at that moment or, or, or rejecting the breast. And Freud thinks a whole cognitive style comes out of this stage, namely accepting or rejecting. And uh, analysts will speak of oral people, that is to say people who have that kind of cognitive style or that kind of style of relating to people where it's either black and white, you're either with me or you're against me. And people who... When you're with me, they, they, it's as if they're taking you in, they're consuming you. So that's the way in which these stages are not simply about what you find sexy uh, later in your life, but also what kind of soul you have, what kind of relationships you have. And if you get fixated, as they say uh, in this tradition, if you get fixated at the oral stage, it's not only then that you're going to find um, the mouth to be the source of greatest bodily pleasure or sexual satisfaction in this broader sense of sex so that you know you'll especially like kissing or oral sex but also that you'll have this cannibalistic way of relating to other people this uh, black and white accepting or rejecting mode of of relating to people 
So much for, then for the oral stage. The next stage is the anal stage, which, as I mentioned, happens between two and three years old. And there are sort of two phases in this, so sub-phases. One is the fact that the baby has been been being uh, wiped, uh, having its you know dirty diapers removed, which can be uncomfortable, of course. And lovingly, in, in the best cases, the, the parents, the mom especially, he's thinking in this case, I don't know that Freud ever changed a diaper, but uh, this is 1905. And the mother will say, gives relief from the discomfort of the dirty diaper and does so ideally with love and attention and not uh, too much uh, interest because that, you know, he's aware that there's abuse at every stage or there can be, but um, the anus, just like the mouth, is full of nerve endings. Uh, He's aware, and if it's regularly wiped in a way that relieves pain and is done so with love and attention, then the anus becomes another erotogenic zone, that is to say, a place where pleasure is felt intensely. Uh, The relief of pain certainly is felt. And then, between the ages of two and three, he thinks there's potty training and this of course is culturally relative some cultures do it earlier than others Um, but roughly between the ages of two and three in Vienna I guess in 1905 and potty training is a new stage for the child because first of all they have to perform Uh, they've been given a lot of leeway about you know what they're expected to do to this point, but now the parents are eager for them to do this uh, well, to do it at all, and put a lot of pressure on the child so that the child can become anxious about this performance and also recognizes that he can say no. He can thwart the wishes of his parents, not to say that that was never possible before. I mean, the the one-year-old senses the parent wants him to eat something and he can reject it as well, but uh, Freud's focusing on the fact that, that that parents really want the child to start potty training after all these years of changing diapers. And when the child recognizes he can say no and that he's in control, then a new way of relating to objects, as he says, um, objects of desire, and the parents in this case, arrives. And that's the sadistic mode. So the other name for the anal stage is the sadistic stage because the child can take pleasure in upsetting the parents through this rebellion. And that style can persist into adult life. Uh, Again, of somebody who's become fixated at that stage, that's a person who used to be called anal retentive. Uh, I, I failed to mention that another pleasure to be achieved according to Freud in this stage, is retaining the feces and the feeling of fullness and then the the feeling of evacuating, that uh, that can become pleasurable, especially when it's wound up with the pleasure of the wiping that I mentioned earlier. At any rate, the anal retentive person, you don't hear that full phrase much anymore. Um, Occasionally you'll still hear so-and-so is anal. And what that means is somebody who's rigid, controlling, and perhaps even sadistic. And this is not simply going to be somebody who takes pleasure in the activity of their anus, so that this is somebody who might like anal sex, for example, again, to explain the so-called perversions on his list of behaviors and fantasies that are needing to be explained in a way that they couldn't be by the normative view. But also, this is going to be somebody who's going to have a certain cognitive style, a certain way of relating to people, uh, the sadistic way. And so it can explain why someone's into sadism and masochism, for example. So that list I made earlier, so-called perversions, these stages are checking off one by one, maybe not completely, but some, many of those so-called perversions. And he's through these stages explaining now, for better or for worse, not to say that these are above criticism, but he's at least trying to explain why it is that people find all these different things sexy? And the answer is that every child has to go through these stages and some people get fixated. You know, they, uh, their parents eroticize the wiping in a way that makes uh, anal pleasure supreme for them or um, simply 
they're bored with more nerve endings there such that that's more uh, appealing to them than anything else that they can get through their mouth, for example. So that Freud recognizes people come in with different constitutions, but also people are subjected to different environments. And again, this these differences create the uniqueness of each person's path through these various stages. And it's not only that someone can get frozen or fixated, say at the oral stage or, or at the subsequent anal stage, but also, as we'll see as we you know, come to the end of this story, that each of these stages persists even in what will be full adult sexuality. They persist, in other words, as the child moves through, it's not that she um, no longer feels oral pleasure after she's started enjoying anal pleasure, but rather anal pleasure takes supremacy over the oral pleasure, which re- still remains. So that someone in adult life who's gone through all these stages in more or less the normal way will still have remainders of oral pleasure, anal pleasure, and so on. So that even if they get married and have heterosexual sex that's copulative for the purpose of reproduction, they will still enjoy kissing. They will still enjoy stimulation of these other erotic genic zones. They might still enjoy a spanking or whatever because of the the remnant of the sadistic anal stage. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me next do the genital stage. This is in a way the most complicated, though I'm going to give it short shrift for our purposes. This is supposed to happen between ages three and five. Its nickname, its alternate name is the Oedipal phase, one of the most famous ideas Freud has, for better or for worse. And I think what's valuable in his description of this stage is that at this point, you know, certainly at some point in the child's life, but we can imagine it being at this point, the child has to come to terms with the fact that significant relationships are not only one-on-one, such as baby with breast or baby with mom who's cleaning diaper, but they're they're not just dyadic in that way, they're also triadic. It's a relationship between the child and two parents, or a child and a parent and a sibling, but Freud's thinking of the you know, bourgeois family of Vienna. It's the mother and the father and the child, and the child, in his description, is a boy, significantly, because it doesn't really work or it certainly doesn't work as well if, if even the first model works. It doesn't really work with a girl, but uh, to make it simple to explain, the boy has developed oral pleasure and then anal pleasure as a result of his relationship with his mother. He's very much in love with his mother. He wants to have an exclusive relationship with her of the sort that he's enjoyed uh, for the first three years of his life through the care that she's been giving him. And then dad starts to enter more in the scene and... Um, he realizes that his um, his exclusive relationship with mom is now loosening and that dad, in fact, has um, more rights to her than he does. And that makes him very angry and sees dad as a rival. He gets jealous and starts fantasizing about hurting his dad, but then he realizes his dad is much stronger than he is. And so he gets afraid and anxious and famously, Freud says the, uh, the fantasy that his father will castrate him is born in his mind, and that's where the fear or anxiety of castration arises. The cor- correlate for the girl is, is penis envy. I, I don't really want to get into all this. I think this is where Freud gets a bad reputation, probably rightly so. But as I say, the valuable part here, from my point of view, is the recognition that love and sex encounter the complications of three people, the love triangle and the genital phase, uh, the Oedipal phase is um, Freud's way of naming that complication and that fact of life that everyone must negotiate one way or another. And the reason it's called Oedipal, uh, you know, obviously since our earlier episode talked about uh, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex is that uh, Oedipus famously was destined to kill his father and sleep with his mother. And Freud's explanation for why that play is so gripping, why it's endured so long, is that people, uh, all of us, but again, his theory works, if at all, only with boys and and men, uh, all of us have that fantasy at some deep level. All of us uh, are in love with our mother because of these early pleasures and recognize that father 
uh, get jealous of father and want to kill him because of the threat that he poses to that unique relationship between mother and child. And Oedipus actually gets to do it so that the fate of Oedipus is to do what everybody, or at least every man, according to Freud, secretly wishes to do. The, the next two stages, I'll just say very quickly, are latency and puberty. The resolution of the Oedipal phase is when the child, the boy in this case, renounces his claim to his mother because of his fear of castration, and he switches from his devotion to his mother to becoming devoted to his father. And now he doesn't hate his father, rather he, he's, he loves his father, and instead of trying to eliminate his father, he wants to become like his father so that he can possess a woman the way his father possesses his mother. And this is now the entrance into the latency period, which is age five until puberty. The boy has renounced his pre-pubertal um, sexuality. He's repressed this desire for mom, and, and he's repressed the other sexual pleasures, so-called sexual pleasures he enjoyed from the other two erotogenic zones, the, the mouth and the anus. And so he seems non-sexual. And this is Freud's explanation for how people can falsely believe that children are not sexual. They think that latency children are typical of children, and latency children seem non-sexual. Um, I mean, I have a son who thinks it's gross that people go on dates or that people kiss and so on. He closes his eyes during those parts of a, of a movie, and he's in this phase. So there's certainly uh, a truth about this observation that children of this age seem non-sexual. Freud thinks that it's not only that we focus on that age when we think about children's relationship with sexuality, but also that part of the repression um, that marks the transition from the genital period to the latency period is what he calls infantile amnesia, that everything about, or most of the things about uh, sex from the first five years are deliberately forgotten or repressed so that the latency child forgets um, you know, enjoying those things that he enjoyed for the first five years of his life and that that repression continues into adult life so that even when puberty resumes um, sexual desire, it's forgotten forever that the person ever enjoyed these things with mother, for example, let alone father. When puberty disrupts this uh, latency period where uh, there was, a, a, if you like, a pure love, uh, pure of sexual desire uh, that we could call affection for however many years between age five and, and puberty, when puberty and the, and the arrival of the hormones that Freud was only dimly familiar with, disrupts that, um, sexual desire comes to the fore again, and now the, um, the genital, uh, again, in the typical development, the genitals, um, like Lucretia said with the adolescent boy, uh, assume a renewed primacy, but that um, the anal and the oral pleasures are, as I mentioned earlier, subsumed into that so that even the teenager who wants to copulate, if not for the purpose of reproduction, will nonetheless find kissing, looking, and, and touching appealing, uh, and perhaps the other uh, activities mentioned before. But the real problem, uh, problem that I think is interesting here at the stage of puberty, is that the sexual currents of the first three stages um, can or cannot fuse with the affectionate currents characteristic of the latency period. And, and Freud has some interesting things to say about, I mean, so when they do fuse, when uh, that those sexual stages and the desires associated with each of them fuse with the affectionate currents of the latency period, what you get is an adult or a teenager and eventually an adult who is able to be sexually attracted to the people uh, he or she loves and is able to love the people to whom he or she is sexually attracted. The pathology is when somebody loves a certain kind of woman and, because Freud thinks this happens with some men, um, loves a certain kind of woman but simply cannot feel any sexual desire for her. And the women for whom he feels sexually desire, for whom he feels sexual desire, he simply cannot love. This gets called the Madonna whore complex, that this kind of uh, man 
um, worships some women as a Madonna and, you know, loves them with a pure latency style, affectionate devotion, but has no sexual desire for them whatsoever. And when it comes to his, his lust, he satisfies that with, with the whore, which is to say someone whom he cannot love. And I, I read an article just a couple of weeks ago on Quillette, actually, of, of, a, of a poor guy who confesses to having slept with 200 prostitutes, I think. And part of the story is that he considers himself a feminist, was raised by feminist parents, and uh, he seems to worship uh, and adore women who are whom we call strong women and feminists and so on. Uh, and, he, and he just can't seem to see that, you know, he, and so he feels very guilty about his compulsion to sleep with prostitutes. He, he simply can't seem to see that those are two sides of the same coin, something that uh, someone trained in Freud uh, can see very, very quickly. Okay, so just a few final points about Freud now. So Freud has talked about these so-called perversions and uh, has explained why, where they come from, at least some of them, most of them perhaps, uh, at any rate, some of them, and how it is that the normal view gets the currency that it gets because of infantile amnesia, um, because it stands at the end of a trajectory of stages of development that many people manage to make it through, but some people do not. And that's why some people become fetishists and will only look, say, at certain parts of the body. They'll, they'll become exhibitionists, for example, um, but they don't subsume the looking into uh, the other stages as, as if it were foreplay, but it becomes their primary object. There's an example of a, of a so-called perversion. Freud thinks that people who have these perverse desires, and again, most of the time he's not saying that judgmentally, but simply they're different from the normal view. They have three choices. They can act out their fantasies, and then they're called perverts. They can repress them. So this might be somebody who, you know, to take the case I just mentioned, is an exhibitionist, uh, because looking uh, is what's primarily attractive, can decide simply not to do that. And the result, uh, I mean, the obvious consequence of, of being called a pervert, you know, being a pervert in that sense is going to be the shame and, and the moral... Um, disapproval of, of society so long as it's discovered. In the case of repression, the cost is that this person simply um, won't find appealing the things that he tries to do. There'll be an energy that's missing from his sex and, and his love life as a result, since Freud thinks that love uh, is the uh, co-opting of the sexual stages into the affectionate, the combination of them in, in puberty. So Acting out perverse fantasies has a cost, namely social opprobrium. Repression has a cost, namely um, a wan sex and love life. And the third stage is the solution. And this is the only thing that usually proposes itself as a solution in Freudian psychoanalysis, and it's sublimation. That is, taking the lower and, and turning it into something higher. So let's take the perverse desire to kill the father and sleep with the mother. That's uh, the cliche, the Oedipal desires. To do that, of course, is perverse. And uh, Freud doesn't think you should act out most of these perverse desires. He is, in the end, judgmental about many of them. Uh, he doesn't think it's wrong that they're there. He just thinks it's wrong to act out on them. And I mentioned the combination of the sex book with the dream book. What the, the the way in which they come into contact that really is a small point but then means everything in the analytic context is that dreams are produced by the dream work, if you recall. There's the latent wish which can get transformed by the dream work, by uh, condensation, by primary revision, and so on. And that way the manifest content of the dream will be close enough to the latent content to still be satisfying to the dreamer, but far enough away that it won't provoke the anxiety of uh, morality and shame and so on. Well, since uh, our sexual desires, Freud observes, and I think this is a, a deep and important truth, go through our imagination, that's also where we get the immense, I would say, infinite variety of 
sexual desires and pleasures that human experience because the imagination can do anything with the material of latent wishes and then turn it into the manifest content of, of actual conscious sexual desires. Well, just as a dream can take the latent wish to kill the father and sleep with the mother and transform it through the dream work into an infinite variety of dreams that might be satisfying to the dreamer, and that's a kind of sublimation. And you might recall, if you listen to that earlier episode, that I said that uh, art for Freud is a public dream. And that, that was the day when I, I talked about how Freud takes Nietzsche's theory of art and tragedy and puts it in the soul. Now we're going backwards and we're taking his theory of the soul and showing uh, how it explains art to sublimate the desire to kill your father and sleep with your mother, for example, would be, among other things, to write a play in which that is the subject. And to do that, we can imagine, this is something Freud thought, Sophocles is taking something that he shouldn't act out, Freud thinks, and not repressing it so that he lives a wan sex and love life, but rather turning it into something beautiful that uh, can ennoble other people who have the same desires, even if they're not able to even acknowledge them, as, as most people are, he thinks. Most people are not in touch with those latent wishes unless they've had the privilege to go to psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs>